Hey everybody, Donnie Gardner here with the Boston Terrier Society podcast. Today I have a very special guest. Her name is Joyce Davis and she has 40 years of breeding Boston Terrier experience. Not only does she breed Boston Terriers, but she takes them to shows and competitions. She is an AKC Gold Breeder of Merit. She's bred 78 champions and 15 grand champions. Her and her husband have been breeding Boston Terrier since 1979. And her husband, Tom, he's actually a judge for Boston Terriers at Confirmations. So in this episode, she's going to be talking about basically her breeding program, as well as some other tidbits for Boston Terrier lovers. So I hope you enjoy. Let's get on with the podcast. Hey, Joyce. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. If you could just tell me a little bit about yourself, your breeding program, and how long have you been, you know, playing with Boston Terriers? Well, thanks for inviting me for this podcast, Donnie. I really appreciate it. Uh, my husband, Tom, and I have been dabbling in Boston since 1979. Um, we originally had Great Danes, and I fell in love with the Boston Terriers when we were going to the dog shows. So. Uh, we decided to get a Boston Terrier. Probably didn't purchase our first one the way we should have, but back in 1979, there weren't a whole lot of options. We didn't have social media. But we did show her, almost got her championship. And um, we've been breeding since 1980 and showing. And um, my husband's now an AKC judge, and hopefully I'll go that route myself. Yeah, were you actually showing Great Danes at that point, or were Boston the first time? Yeah, we showed. Yeah, we showed Great Danes, uh, Harlequin Great Danes. Um, we only bred a litter when we wanted to have something to show. So we probably the Great Danes over the years. Uh, maybe we had four or five litters. You still have Great Danes at this point. I have no Great Danes right now. It's all all Boston Terriers. All Boston's. We have an old Ibethan Hound. He's going to be, I think, 13 this year, 12 or 13, and I have a, an eight-year-old pharaoh hound. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so about your Boston Terriers, so whenever I came across your Facebook and everything, so I saw you had 78 champions and 15 grand champions mm -hmm. uh, with Boston Terriers. So me being a lay person, could you first just tell us what that means exactly? Okay, so what that means is 78 champions. It doesn't mean dogs that we purchased or dogs that in the past we handled for somebody else. 78 dogs that we bred or co-bred and we showed them to their championship or maybe the, the new owners showed them to their championship. It's 78 champions that were bred by us. Um, the grand champions is an advanced level of the championship. After they get the championship, um, you can compete with other champions to get AKC Grand Championship points. It's a another criteria, different set of point systems. And um, right now we only have 15 because we've been specialing one particular dog, um, uh, Grand Champion Silver, uh, the vain happy me that we come with Susan Fithian. And we try to be exclusive with him. We don't want the other dogs competing against him. And we're mm -hmm. trying to get his gold level Grand Champion right now. Okay. Um, what goes into as far as champion? Is it just at the confirmation, um, certain aspects and traits they have? Is that how that is labeled? So what you're doing when you're showing at a confirmation mm -hmm. AKC event, um, you're competing against other Boston Terriers. The judges are judging them according to the standard set by the Boston Terrier Club of America. And um, so they they are students of the breed. They get their license, and they judge them according to that. Um, and the standard is a standard of perfection, which the judge, in his opinion, and you are just paying for an opinion as mm -hmm. to what dog is the closest to that standard. And there's first place in classes. The first place in classes compete for winners of their sex, males and females, they call them dogs and bitches. And then you have your champion classes, and the winner's dog and the winner's bitch get to compete against the champions for best of breed, best of winners, best of opposite sex. And then there's also grand champion select for the champions only, 
and that's for one a male and a bitch. Okay. As far as I'm assuming you're breeding champions or trying to breed champions, how would your breeding program be different from someone else's program? Okay. Well, I don't know if it's different. This is what I this is what I do. This is my plan over the last forty years. I like to do line breeding. Line breeding means breeding dogs with similar backgrounds. Um, on occasion, I haven't had the opportunity to do it lately, but I've done my grandfather to granddaughter, half uncle to half niece. But basically what I'm doing right now is maybe, maybe breeding um, dogs with like great grandparents that are uh, maybe similar in the background or great aunts, great uncles. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do a lot of uh, breeding to outside stud dogs. I shop around maybe every seven to ten years um, looking for a, a good male from a good bloodline, healthy dogs. I, and where you shop is at the specialties and at the national specialty. You get to see um, a lot more dogs of certain bloodlines um, to be able to compare what like a certain male is producing. And mm-hmm. um, if I see something I like, and of course temperament is very important too, um, I will approach that breeder and and discuss um, future litters they might have. And I will you know, purchase a male to add to the kennel. And it has mm-hmm. been successful so far. I'm, so I'm curious, this is more just for me, as far as, you know, going out and finding a Boston Terrier for purchase and uh, to enter your program and everything. You know, if I was to go buy a Boston Terrier from a reputable breeder, chances are they're going to have me, you know, have that Boston spayed or neutered. How does that mm-hmm. work since you're looking for, obviously, the sex intact? Well, I'm, I'm looking to purchase a puppy to, to show and breed, and, and they know mm-hmm. that up front. Okay. Um, so it, it's never a question of, of why am I purchasing this male? Mm-hmm. I, it's always right up. I'm, I'm looking to add a new male to our kennel. Uh, I have questions for this breeder as to maybe some of the dogs they produce. There might be maybe I'm looking for a dog um, that's not producing a lot of white. Sometimes you get too many white markings. I'm I'm looking for a top line. Maybe there's certain things I need to correct currently in my in my particular kennel. And so I'm looking for a dog that's consistent and strong in that aspect. Okay. Um, as far as like key factors in a successful, I guess, champion line, whenever you are uh, creating your breeding program, what are some of those key factors? I guess what should people have in their breeding program if they're wanting to breed champions? First mm-hmm. of all, okay, you, I mean, I'm sure you've heard this before, you can't be kennel blind, meaning thinking your dogs are the only perfect dogs out there and nobody else's matter. You have to have an open mind and an open eye, and that's why we compete at dog shows. You're asking for an opinion. If your dog is consistently not winning, you need to, to look at it and reevaluate why. It's not because um, this other exhibitor knows the judge or... You know, it's political. It, it's not always that way. It truly isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to really have an open eye as to what you're breeding. And, and again, temperament's very important, too. And the, does that answer? Does yeah, that no, that's, that, no, that's okay. great. Okay. Um, as far as, like, picking out their temperament whenever they're a little puppy, what, um, mm-hmm. what are some things you look for? Oh, an, out, an, an outgoing puppy. Mm-hmm. Um, I call them the bad puppies sometimes. They're the, the, <laughs> the ones with the curiosity. Uh, they're not afraid. Um, people come to the house, and they're curious, and they want to meet the people. I, When somebody comes to my house to look at a puppy, mm-hmm. when they sit on the floor, to me, that's a plus for them. I don't like people that are standing there and brushing the hair off their pants and don't want to touch the dogs. I, I want to see how you interact with the puppy, too. Now, I I have a little bit of an edge on most people. I work at a veterinary hospital, and, of course, my dogs have to be cesarean sectioned. And so I have – I'm very, very fortunate that I work in a place where I can keep my puppies sort of isolated but with an eyesight all the time. And so they get used to noises and sounds and 
Uh, they, I drive them back and forth to work with me every day. Mm. Oh, so, great. yeah, they get so they do get socialized. It's a little different than most people scenarios or setups. Right. Yeah. Um, as far as like pricing your puppies and everything, how does that work? You know, let's say I was going to purchase a Boston from you. What goes into your pricing strategy? I guess. Okay. Because I've, so, I've seen it all over the place. It is all over the place. Um, I get a little frustrated with some of the very high ticket prices I see on puppies nowadays. Now, again, I work at a veterinary hospital. Of course, I get breaks on on, on my services, and so I don't inflate prices. I try. All I want to do is break even. This is not my business. This is my hobby, and this is my passion. Mm-hmm. So, I. Um, I evaluate, you know, what I have into the litter, how many puppies, expenses. Sometimes there's expenses that are unforeseen. Maybe you had a sick puppy. I've had puppies that have aspirated. It costs a little bit extra money for for treatment, Um, maybe a complication with the C-section. The parents are health tested. I, you know, I I do some health testing on the puppies before they leave the litter. So I I try to... um, evaluate what I have into the litter and what I need to get out of it. Uh, and I don't want to be so overpriced that that really, really fantastic family that needs a puppy can't afford it. Right. So as far as you, so, you know, whenever Emily and I had bought Bella, this was 10 years ago, and we didn't know anything at the point. We just graduated college and we knew we wanted a Boston Terrier that was AKC registered. Mm-hmm. So we ended up finding a Boston down in Springfield, Missouri, and we had to drive a couple hours because we're from Kansas City, and we paid three hundred and fifty dollars for her. Mm-hmm. We went into a pet store originally, you know, once again mm-hmm. didn't know anything, and it was thirteen hundred dollars, but he was going to cut us a deal by giving us a hundred dollars off because um, <laughs> he said he liked us. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was in a used car dealership, but. Oh, I- Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What What would you say is a, a crazy high price? Because I've even seen them online as high as uh, I can recall three thousand five hundred, but I want to say I saw one for five thousand. Well, okay, I, I'm going to just lay it out there what I charge for puppies. It can change because it just depends on what expenses are. Right. Uh, my pet puppies are twelve to fifteen. My show yeah, puppies are. Uh, let's just say my show puppies are less than two thousand. Mm-hmm. Okay, and yeah, a lot of that sense. can be tweaked, but I will never sell a dog forever. That mm-hmm. um, yeah. I, I think it's ridiculous, and I do take into consideration if somebody is going to show mm-hmm. their expenses. To me, when they're showing my dog, they're advertising my kennel, and Absolutely. I like to try and give them a break. Sometimes that show puppy, if it's the right person, will go for the price of a pet puppy. Mhm. Okay. Yeah. I would always assume those would be higher. Yeah. Well, it, it's like I said, a lot of it factors in. Uh, and again, like you, you have one or two puppies, you have to try to cover expenses. But I've never sold a, sold a, a puppy for for that over two thousand dollars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And actually, not even close to that. Okay. Yeah. Although you have been breeding since 1979, Boston Terrier. Mm-hmm. So if this mm-hmm. podcast is 30 years in the future, maybe it might be higher. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, as far as just the average person spotting a good breeder, um, you know, to buy their Boston from, what mm-hmm. would, um, what should they look for? I guess are questions they might ask. Well, they can't send an email or a text or a or a Facebook message saying how much is your dog. That right there, you're not going to get a response from me. Mm-hmm. Period. I want somebody to introduce themselves um, if they've had dogs before, um, you know, just to give a little bit of background. And if the first price is how much, and as I just mentioned to you, I don't charge that much. If the first price, or if, I'm sorry, if the first comment is how much, mm-hmm. I, I just, I get, I'm just picky. I'm just picky about that. There's certain, like, again, this is my passion. Mm-hmm. I'm not a, I'm not uh selling puppies and paying the, the electric bill here. Right. Um, so um, you you want to go to try to go to some dog events, see if there's a even an all-breed 
kennel club in your area, even if there's no Boston Terrier breeders in that club, you can still get information from the kennel club as to what to look for for a breeder, you know, where to find one if they don't have that particular breeder of, of Boston Terriers in their club. They, they can maybe refer you to some other local area. Uh, contact the National Club. The National Club has a breeder referral. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you find a breeder that, that you think you like, you don't meet them in a parking lot. You don't meet them on the highway or at a rest stop. You want to go to their place and meet them. A lot of people are getting a little afraid of letting strangers into their home nowadays, and I understand that. But mm-hmm. if you've had enough conversation with these people, and I'll, I'll be honest, I, I search people on Facebook. And I tell them I'd like to be friends with them, you know, before they come. So I can see yeah, what they do in their lives with their, with their family. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want people to come here. I want them to see the dogs. They can see the parents. They can see siblings, maybe older siblings, our aunts, uncles. I want them to see how we take care of our dogs. The place doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be a mansion. It's just the dogs are happy, clean, healthy, and well-adjusted. Okay. And uh, anybody that tells you they want to meet you, make things convenient, just go away. You know, you, you need to go <laughs> further. And it's, I like to sell my puppies, especially my pet puppies, locally, which if there's a problem, I want it to be within driving distance, meaning three hours or less. I want I don't want to sell puppies too far away because I can't help them if they have a problem. Right. So as far as whenever, and uh, I'll, I'm going to have to edit a little bit of it because it cut out there for a second. But as far as when somebody buys a puppy, you know, just the average person from you, do you offer basically where they can call you anytime? Yes, absolutely. Call, text, message. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I'm there for them for the entire life of that dog. Okay. Yeah. And I've seen that in a lot of great breeders. Like it's not mm-hmm. like you just sell a puppy and go about your business. It's a lifetime commitment. It is um, a lifetime commitment. As far as someone wanting just to maybe start a quality beef breeding program, what are some things that you'd recommend for that? Again, join a local club, join mm-hmm. a local Boston Terrier club. If there's not a local Boston Terrier club, join an all breed club. I there When we started, there weren't very many Boston Terrier breeders in our area. Um, our mentors were people that bred um, miniature pinchers, great danes, uh, yeah, bulldogs. That, those were our mentors. And you still learn a lot from people that are not in your breed. There's mm-hmm. a lot to learn. And there's a lot of general information that you can learn from them. And you can have great mentors in how you how you raise your dogs, your ethics. Um, so that if you're going to breed dogs, you, you really, it, it's not, you can't do it haphazard. You really can't. Especially in this breed where most of the litters, at least here in the United States, are delivered via you know, cesarean section. So mm-hmm. it's a little tricky, a little more stressful. Right, yeah, and a little more expensive as far as mm-hmm. raising. Um, okay, well, as far as maybe a tip that you want to give or any other additional information that you'd just like to share before we wrap up here? Well, I would just hook on to a good mentor. Ask a lot of questions. If somebody doesn't want to answer your questions, find somebody else. You will you will find a good mentor if you're persistent at it. Um Again, join clubs. Don't get involved with the negative Nellies. Uh-huh. Those, those are you want to you want to deal with positive people. People that um, they come out of the ring and they're gruff and they're angry and and you know shows fixed that my dog's better. I was robbed or this or that. Stay away from those people. You need to hook up with positive people. And, uh, you know, negativity seems to have a, a larger magnet to it than positivity. But um, I always felt you need to be positive about things. The glass is half full. The glass is not half empty. And and you need to come up with solutions when you have a problem. Um, you should be able to ask questions of, to your mentor no matter you know, if you bought a dog from the north, I, I'll help people even if they don't buy a dog from me. Mm-hmm. Okay, Joyce, as far as people being able to reach out to you and everything, what would be some good options for them? Uh, texting, Facebook Messenger. I mean, you could try to call, but I talk on a phone all day at work. Sometimes I just don't want to answer the phone. 
please, if you see me at a show and you have a question, approach me. I am approachable. I don't know why. I have people say that they think I'm, you know, I'm not approachable. I'm very approachable. <laughs> I get my game face on when I'm going in the ring, and I don't know if it's that or not, but my husband and I always want to help people. We always, always want to help people, and we always will help people. So please approach me at a dog show. You have questions. I mean, not before I go into the ring, but after we're all done, I'll talk to anybody. I'll, I'll help them with anything. Thank you so much for listening to today's podcast. Once again, Joyce's contact information will be in the show notes below. Joyce has extensive knowledge about Boston Terriers, and she is more than happy to help anybody that has Boston Terrier-related questions. So don't be afraid to go up to her for, if you see her at a show, and feel free to contact her with the methods down below. So have a great day, and thanks for listening. Bye.